so earlier on, we uh, like kind of gave you a very brief introduction uh, into continuous delivery. Um, and we talked about lots of things. We talked about what continuous delivery is based on Jesse's refined description, making your software always deployable to maximize feedback. We talked about the issues associated with getting your software into production. We talked about this idea of trying to reduce the cost of a release and, and therefore get a better, better value for your feedback. We talked about continuous integration. We talked, it's a lot we covered. We talked about cloud automated testing, DevOps and agile analytics and sort of a vision for what continuous delivery might be able to deliver for your own organization. Um, so of course, I've got some questions, which was, well, how do I do this? Um, how do I get there? Uh, now, I'm a, I like to think of myself as a good consultant. So I'm going to give you the good consultant answer, which is, well, it depends. <laughs> Um, so, uh, now obviously, that would be a really short presentation. I could probably riff off the rest of the 25 minutes, uh, but I'm at least going to try and explain why it depends and hopefully also present a framework for how, you know, it might, you might be able to adopt continuous delivery in your own organizations using some techniques we use uh, for some of our clients. And the reason it depends is, is kind of because of this. This is different, and the other things that aren't here, the, 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 the people are different, your organization are different, the way your organization is set up compared to, you know, maybe even your competitors is different. The goals you're trying to achieve are different and therefore where you want to spend your time and the optimizations you are going to want to make are going to vary. And we'll talk a bit about some of the trade-offs that you might want to make depending on where you are, what your goals are, what your drivers are. Uh, but a lot of this is people, a lot of it's organization, it's tools, it's all sorts of things. And that's why it varies. That's why for every single client where we start working with them to talk about continuous delivery, we start somewhere different. We, need, we apply ourselves in a different place. Um, the rough framework I'm gonna outline for adopting continuous delivery is, well, starting, knowing where to start is important. Uh, Many of you might be running multiple service lines, multiple projects. You don't attack this big bang. You've got to start somewhere. So, so where do we start? We'll talk about that first. We'll then talk about pulling together a team to make this happen. You are going to be changing the way that people work. Some of these people may have been working in that way for 10, 15, 20 years. They may be in organizations or parts of your organization that have been working in the same way for 30, 40, 50 years even. So how do you assemble a team to make that transition? Knowing where you are is very important. Many of you probably think you know where you are. I'm just gonna let you know you probably don't really know the whole picture. You probably know part of the picture. You, you hear from the squeaky wheels in your organization. You see one or two key metrics that you think are the most important things. There are other things going on. that You need to take account of it. You need to take a holistic view of what's happening within a given service line to know where to apply the change to get the best return. Know your goals, macro level goals. This touches on some of the things that Jim talked about eloquently last year around adaptive leadership. Target your improvement and finally uh, repeat and scale. So we'll start at the beginning. Know where to start. So imagine you've got multiple projects in your portfolio. You're thinking about continuous delivery. You've been, to, you've been here, you've got the book. Um, continuous, it's time's come, you're going back to your business, well, I want to do this now, well, where, where do I go? Uh, for, if there was one key criteria I would say when thinking about what project to start with, it's find a willing set of participants. You need people that, that, that will want this change. Maybe you select this by finding the squeaky wheels that have been complaining about how hard things are and you go talk to them. One of the worst things you could necessarily do is potentially find the worst performing team you've got and go and tell them they're gonna change. Because unless they kind of want to change themselves, then it's gonna be a hard journey. You're better off picking a more willing set of participants and then using them as a role model throughout the rest of your organization. So find somebody that's somehow engaged in what you're trying to achieve. You find some empowered individuals. And you might have to hire people in and shift people around to make that happen. This is key, because they're gonna to have to work with you 
when bringing this change about. If you can, avoid teams where there's a larger degree of time pressure. Some of you might be familiar with the cost of change J curve. It's this idea that you know, if you're trying to bring about a type of change, you go from sort of, well, we're productive here, we're gonna get to this level of productivity, but changing what you do makes you go slower. You're learning about how to do continuous integration. You're learning about automated testing. In the short term, that will, give you, that will slow you down. Now, if you have an extreme amount of time pressure, for example, around a, a delivery of functionality, the temptation is, as you embark on this exercise, to suddenly go, OK, uh, whatever you're doing is taking us too long. We're just going to revert to type. We're going to go back to what we were doing before. And then you've sort of wasted all that effort that you sunk into it. Worse still is that people just don't say they're going to stop doing the new things. They just cut the corners. Because if, you're tight, if you're up, your back's against the wall and you're, you know, you're being shouted at because you haven't got a delivery, what are you going to do? You're going to revert to type. And this is, these are challenging things. So if you start with a, a, a new project, where you're bringing continuous delivery to your organization, and you have extreme time pressure on that same team, then you will find it's a bit hard to succeed. And if it doesn't work, you'll never necessarily know, was it because of the time pressure, or were the ideas just the wrong ideas for us? Because you will make mistakes. That's OK. There are lots of different things that you're going to need to bring to bear for your organization, which we'll talk about a bit later on. So you want to find somewhere that's just maybe not right on the bleeding edge and everyone's hair's on fire. There are other things you do in those situations rather than change how they deliver software. Um, and the final thing when thinking about where to start is you need to find a bit of a balance between how hard it is to achieve the change you want versus getting a bit of a reward on that. Now, you could go look at your portfolio, pick the least risky, easiest thing to do, the easiest team to change. And you could focus all of your efforts there. What's, re what's the reward you're going to get? Equally, what are you going to prove to the rest of the organization? Well, of course, it's easy for them. They're just a you know, single node website. They've got like 500 concurrent users. And you fix them, and they're, they're now delivering continuously. Well, great. Well, what about the 100,000, 200,000 person website over here that's got huge, com complex integration issues? What is it that you've proved? On the other hand, if you pick the most complicated problem, you're giving yourselves all of those hurdles to overcome. So you want to find a bit of a trade-off. The first project you pick needs to be a role model. You would like it to be successful. But you equally want to be able to show that you've addressed some of the core issues inside your organization. So finding and balancing off these three factors should help you understand where should you start. And I would say start with one or two teams. Assemble a team. Think about the standard life cycle. Very much simplified here. Think about all the different roles involved in your own organizations in developing your software, testing it, and operating it. There could be 5, 10, 15 different roles involved. And when you're moving towards continuous delivery, you are potentially going to have to make changes all across this life cycle. So what you need to look for are people within these teams that can effectively become the champions of what you're trying to do. And hopefully you found them because you're looking for willing participants. You're looking for someone that can help drive the change forward across these functional areas, and also who could potentially then help seed other teams afterwards. You may need to bring in outside help um, to fill some of these areas, especially if there's maybe new technologies you're looking to adopt. Obviously, you know, a good professional services firm, I'm sure they could help you out. Um, but th there is this idea that you, these guys are going to be doing the work. So you need to pull those people together. Uh, we'll often do kickoffs when we're starting off these processes, and we'll get everybody in the room. They may not always be intricately involved with it, but they should be aware of what's happening. A lot of what you're trying to do with continuous delivery is break down the barriers between these additional roles. And so by starting by getting everybody on the same foot and in keeping them involved in what's happening, uh, you can really help maintain that idea that people are really aligned around delivering the product rather than you know, just passing a widget from here to here. Understand where you are. I made the comment that many of you probably don't know where you are. Uh, it's, 
didn't mean to be offensive. I, I'm sure you're all very smart people. I know you are. But the issue is there is so much going on at the micro and macro level that it's very hard for one person to have the entire view. Um, there's often a reason why you're looking to embark on a power of change. You're seeing some pain. You're seeing a market opportunity you can't otherwise exploit. But getting some detail about what's happening is very important. Um, this is a real-world example from a client we worked with. This is using a technique, kind of, it's value stream mapping. Um, well, within this organization, uh, we spent a lot of time working with the team, talking to them about the problems they are seeing within their own, own team. We talked to developers, we spoke to the, the product owner, and they all told us different stories. And very early on, we were told, well, we see a lot of issues in that it takes us a long time to pick up a feature uh, and once the developer's picked up a feature to implement, they implement it and they check it in, it then takes us a long time to get that feature into production. And we think that's a barrier to us delivering enough software to make our clients happy, our internal stakeholders happy. When we actually sat down and went through the whole process, we found it could take up to 46 weeks for an idea to be documented in a BRD before it even got to a point where a developer picked it up. So the initial view was the problem is here, when you actually stood back and looked at the macro level, you realized that the problem was elsewhere. Now, if you're thinking about trying to maximize your feedback, we could lower the barrier to entry down here to, for a release. We could reduce it by two weeks. But what does feedback mean? Does the idea I have actually work? And if the idea is here, we haven't really addressed the whole. Uh, this is another example. Um, and the techniques behind these are exactly the same. We just visualize them in different ways for different clients. Uh, here, the really interesting thing was um, we spoke to multiple different uh, groups. Uh, each one of these lines represents a, an artifact that is deployed as part of this system. And it's actually a, a fairly straightforward system that does some data cleansing. No one was aware of all of these lines. You knew some people that knew two or three of these lines. All of these lines were being, being deployed onto the same production uh, machine to make the software work. And they, they knew about two or three of these lines. We found like six. Um, so already there's value there. And, and uh, while we were capturing these exercises, we also would do things like identify. I mean, these are, this is very uh, quantitative information. You know, you're, we, we are tracking here cycle time, which is very important. We're looking at the stages that your software moves through. So here we're actually mapping some of the processes off. We've got continuous integration, first ETL checks, and regressions, and those sorts of things. This is like detailed real-world information. We're also tracking a lot of qualitative information. Where was the pain experienced? Where were people having problems? You know, where was uh, the release manager having to have um, sleepless nights? Um, this is really useful, too, because if you're going to bring about a change and you can make people's lives on the project better, that change is going to stick. So tracking that at the same time is, is, uh, is, is, is useful. Another technique we use is uh, something called the CD maturity model. There's a version of this in, in Jez's book. The CD maturity model talks about some of the practices involved with, with continuous delivery. We find that this is very useful to, as a guideline about where you are and where you could, and a sort of natural progression for how you get more advanced in certain disciplines. We dislike intensely any maturity model used for comparing one project with another or comparing your company with somebody else's company. Uh, there's an awful lot wrong with those uses. We use this purely to say, well, look, if you're here and you want to progress, these are the ways in which you want to progress. So using this is a very useful way to understand where are we with various disciplines. And it covers a multitude of disciplines that will help you understand the different areas you might need to have impact on to, to achieve continuous delivery. We talked about continuous integration earlier. This talked about extending that into the deployment pipeline area. Uh, we have configuration management. I mentioned Chef and Puppet earlier. This is how do you manage the configuration of your system, uh, the version control of your artifacts, tracing, visibility within, say, from, a, from an operations point of view. We have data management. Can you apply schema changes in an automated fashion? Are you version controlling that? Uh, or is it all still a manual process? Environments and deployment. 
how much control and flexibility do you have? Your QA practices, visibility within the organization. Remember we talked about wanting to break down barriers, wanting to give feedback. Well, you need to be visible to give feedback. Organizational alignment. Are you all, all these groups you're working with, are you aligned around your goal of releasing software? And really importantly, system architecture. Is the way your system designed conducive to continuous delivery? Um, and, and, the, and really, it gives you a model of where are you. Now, the key thing is, is a, it gives you a, like a one through five scale. You don't need to be level five. It's not about that. It's saying, where am I? Where do I want to go to? What makes sense for me? And this gives you a guidance on, on maybe where you want to concentrate your, your effort. Know your goals. Here, I'm kind of talking about the macro level view. How is it that this product, this project, this service line is going to achieve success? Jim talked um, last year uh, in, in regards of adaptive leadership about this comparison really between those organizations, those groups, those departments that achieve success through efficiency, which is coarsely put, doing what everyone else does just way better than they do it. So we're not making the best widget, we're making it the most effectively, the most efficiently. Walmarts of this world, lots of other people sell goods. We just do it the best and the cheapest and the most efficient. Versus responsiveness, those organizations that succeed by innovating, by coming up with new things, new ideas, and getting those ideas out quickly and understanding how successful they are. Um, and I'm going to steal shamelessly from an example Jim gave to help you understand how this might have an impact on your decision-making process about what you're going to try and do. Where are you going to focus when you're going on your you know, adopting continuous delivery? Uh, Gap have been a long-time client of ours, and they were launching a new brand called uh, um, Athleta. Now, Athleta uh, is an online-only brand for selling high-end uh, women's sportswear. And it was uh, driven by the website part of Gap, and it was a very successful launch. It did extremely well. And they started getting uh, some feedback that, well, when is this going to be in stores? We'd like shops. Now, if you think about an organization the size of Gap, you don't just go and launch a whole new chain of shops. There's a lot of investment there. But they thought, well, what we'll do is we'll launch one or two pop-up stores, see what the appetite is. Are we really getting the footfall we need? Is there a long-term margin, uh, long-term revenue stream for us here? So they went to their stores department, the bricks and mortar people, the people that roll out Gap stores across the US and across the UK and I mean, you probably see about 25 Gap stores within 100 yards of here. And they said, how long will it take us to get a store out? Bear in mind, it took them about four months to get a fleet up and running online. They were told 12 to 18 months. Now, the key thing is, the bricks and mortar store weren't doing a bad job. They were just optimized around efficiency. They were optimized for delivering the 105th store, the 106th store. They were optimized for dealing with efficient rollout of a large chain of stores. That's how they worked. The online brand, that's not how they worked. That's not how they were successful. They were successful around responsiveness. So in this situation, they took the decision, we are going to go launch that store ourselves. And they had to cut some corners. And it would have cost them more. But they got it into the market quickly enough to prove the idea out. And then they could then decide to make the step to actually do it in an efficient way. The key thing here is here, within an organization, you might have different groups, different roles that want to do different things. So you're thinking about the practices that you might want to roll out, how that might drive you in a different direction. You know, if you're looking at efficiency, you're going to be very interested in things like eliminating system duplication, because you don't have to maintain two systems. You're going to be very uh, keen to invest time in automated uh, testing, NFR testing, automated testing. Now, if you're more interested in trying out new ideas, you'll still need some of this. But maybe you're going to put more emphasis on knowing how my system works, the analytics. Is my system behaving how I thought it was? You might put more effort into A-B testing, the idea that you can present two different uh, sets of functionality to users. What is it that works well? Some organizations that focus on responsiveness care much more about incredibly fast release and turnaround times, being able to release you know, daily 
rather than spending as much time on automated testing, knowing that, well, we're going to try lots of things out. We might let a couple of bugs through, but what we're going to do is get really good at fixing them very, very fast in production. It's a trade-off you get to make. Now, obviously, if you're the Apollo program, you don't want to get really good at fixing failure after it happens, because at that point, you lost an astronaut, right? But there are trade-offs to be had here. Um, some operations teams, for example, focus much more about mean time to recovery than mean time between failure. So it depends on where you are. This is going to guide those practices and those areas that are going to be more important for you in terms of how you want to achieve an improvement. So you've thought about that. You've thought about where you are. The, the macro, how are you going to be successful? So now where do you start? And typically, you can do a lot of that. The stuff I talked about in a few weeks doesn't actually take that long. So where do we start now? Well, you need to target what you're going to try and do, but do it within a time limit. You don't necessarily know what your organization is going to look like in five years. Pick something sensible. Three months, a bit short. Six months is good. A year, probably a bit too long. So look at where you are. Look at where the pain is. Thinking about where it is, how it is you're going to be successful. Thinking about what it is your organization is trying to achieve. Where do I focus my effort? Do I focus my effort on taking the eight weeks post-check-in cycle and making it six weeks? Or do I focus on the 46-week process of getting an idea into the hands of a developer? What's going to give me the best return? What's going to take me more time? And focus your efforts. So with this particular client, the, we didn't actually need to reduce the cycle time that much. The real issue was, was actually some consolidation and some rigor. All of these different service lines went through very different processes involved in different people. What we were looking at was trying to rationalize that so they could go about their business in a much more efficient manner. So their after effect was much more about rationalization, and that was more of their focus than it was about the, 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 the time to market. The continuous delivery maturity model can help here. So this is a, a result of an exercise I did with one client. This was where they were in terms of various disciplines. And they thought, well, based on the problems we see in our path to production, with this holistic view that we've now got, this shared holistic view, where are we going to be? What are the practices? What are the gaps that we think we need to fill? Again, within a six-month period, what's feasible to do? Um, and this is what they came up with. They thought, you know what? Actually, data management, we're not very good. But you know what? It's going to be quite hard for us to change in that period of time. In this particular example, they were looking to move a whole lot of database infrastructure at the same time, so it was quite difficult to think about change. It wasn't feasible. And there was a, there's a, this value that comes from saying, we know it's not great, but that's not what we're going to focus our attention right now. Instead, they saw more value in improving their uh, continuous integration and configuration management practices. It's, you don't have to be five. It's just where are you going to go next? And once you've done all of these things, you've thought about where it is you want to go, um, within a, a relative time scale, a six-month time scale is, is very good here. Well, the, uh, the next thing for you to do is to repeat and scale. Moving towards continuous delivery is not a transactional thing. It's not something that should just be a fire and forget activity. You don't do it once and then slack off. Uh, I was talking to a client just in the break, and they're talking about, it, it's, it's, yeah, it's been great, but, but now we've done it. They keep wanting us to do it, you know, do more. You know, other teams want us to help out. Well, that's good. All of these things we talked about, knowing where you are, knowing where you want to get to, targeting your improvement. I think initially it can be a little bit big bang. You have to get people together. You have to build that willing coalition to show them the tools that are available to them to improve. But you need to get to a place where this is just happening as a matter of course. Within one team, that can then get to that place. And then you can look to take people and seed other parts of your organization. But it all comes back to um, this idea that this should be a self-sustaining thing. So you know, know where to start. Pick your team well. Assemble a group of people that can carry out those changes for you. Understand where you are. And share that view. Remember those six service lines? Everybody knew about those six service lines at the end of that four-week piece of work. A lot of people were surprised, but everybody knew about them. Uh, know what your goals are. Macro goals. Where are we going? How are we as a department 
going to be successful? How is this product going to, going to achieve success in the organization? Are we looking for efficiency? Are we looking for responsiveness? Target the improvements where it's going to get the most return on your investment and repeat and scale those changes out across your own organizations. Okay. 